Okay, everyone. I'm here to make a video for our Project 3 Silly QL to give you an intro to starting the project. So I've got a bunch of notes here of things I want to cover. So the first thing to remember is this project is meant to be built in pieces. You do not have to understand everything about indices and how indices affect other commands and how join works in order to start working on the project. In fact, even if you write code without worrying about indices, and then later on you say, oh, I've got to add the code for indices, you're not going to be throwing away the original code. What you're going to be doing is you're going to be adding a little bit of code to say, oh, if there's an index and it's on the right column and it's useful to me, I do it the new way, otherwise, old code. So with one exception, indices are not going to cause you to throw away code. For the most part, they're going to cause you to put that code inside of an if or inside of an else. The starting point, obviously, command line. There's one command line option that you have to worry about, which is quiet mode. Help you can do if you want to, but you can parse the command line pretty easily by now with your third project. After that, start reading input. I want to talk about reading input because it's really important in this project to do it the right way. What we want to do is a do while loop. Because we know we have to read at least one command, we start with a do while loop. So I'm going to do this stuff. What I'm going to do, C out, a prompt, followed by a space, and then C in into a command. Uh, let's just say CMD. What's CMD? A string. Oh, I didn't leave myself enough room to put it at the top. String. CMD. Okay, so I'm going to read that command. I'm going to do a bunch of stuff to process that command. And we'll talk about the different commands in a little bit. But then after I'm done processing that command, I keep on doing this while CMD is not equal to quit. Once they type quit, they're done. The loop has to go through at least once. The test is never done until the bottom of the loop. So we always print a prompt, we read a command, we process that command, do everything we have to, and then if it wasn't a quit command, when we come back through the loop, we'll automatically print out another prompt. So you don't have to have the prompt in multiple places. This is the right way to start reading. In this project, you want to use greater than, greater than, unless you've got stuff to throw away. The project syntax of the commands is very well formed so that at any point, you either know there's an error, in which case I'm going to get the rest of the input and throw it away, or I know what I'm going to read next. You always want to read with greater than, greater than. You don't want to try to get line a whole command and then try to figure out where the first word is and the second word is. You don't want to do a get line and then push it into a string stream and then read the string stream with greater than, greater than. Just read from CN with greater than, greater than. If you get an error though, like if someone says create a table and that table already exists, you clear out the rest of the line with get line, you print your error message, and then you come back through the while loop and get a new command. All right, so that takes care of reading. Um, every command's well formed. I talked about that. What commands should we do in what order? I'm going to assume you read the spec now. So, quit command. We're almost done with it. Because we've got to have, when we process the command, we've got to have something to do if we don't recognize the command. We need to at least do nothing when we do see a quit command. So quit's almost done. Next command I would write is comment. Because if I see a number sign is the, is the first part of the string, I know I can do a get line and throw the rest of it away. Comment command's done. Then after that, we gotta start actually doing some work. So my suggested order after that is the create command. Remove isn't especially exciting, but it's easy to do. If you can write create, remove is even simpler than that. So we may as well get it done quickly. Then after that, the next important ones are insert and print all. 
And that will get to you to a point where if you can create a table and you can insert data and you can print all, then you can really see that the projects work. Then after that, you can start worrying about other things like delete rows and print where, generate index, join, the complicated stuff. Get to the, first, get to the simple part first. Quit, comment, create and remove. Once you do create and remove, it'll be really easy, and then insert and print all. Okay, so after that, let's talk about different things. At a high level, let's talk about high level data structures. It's possible that someone using your program might create multiple tables at a time and then do commands like insert into this table, print from that table, uh, delete from the other table. They might be doing lots of commands with lots of different tables. So you need a quick way to go from the name of a table to everything associated with that table. And that's where hash tables or unordered map comes in. Unordered map is an associative container. We give it a key type and a value type. See, before when we've done things like with a vector, we just fill a vector with one type, like integers. Well, here we're gonna have an unordered map that goes from the key type is going to be a string, meaning a table name, to a whole table object. Whatever goes into what we call a table, let's make a type for it and have a way to map table names to everything about that table. What's everything about that table? We'll get to that in just a minute. So we want that at the high level. So what's in a table object? So a good thing to put in there would be the table name. It's not critical, but I found it was easier to write the code if every table has a string variable that it knows its own name. Makes things a little bit easier. Um, everything that came from the create command. I'm going to change apps here. So everything that came from, oh, this thing is irritating. When I change screens on it, it wants to disappear and close and ask me if I want to visit the app store and all kinds of silly things. Okay, there we go. So when we talk about what is in a table, well, first of all, what's in a table is the things that come from the create command, which is things like the column names, the column types, which here would probably be string, string, int, and double is what it looks like. So those, so I would have inside of a table class, I would have some way to remember the column names, some way to remember the column types, some way to remember what the order is so that when someone says, like, do something with model, I know that it's, like, index one. We'll get to that in a minute. But I know it's, like, model would be index one, price would be index two, et cetera. So I've got to be able to do that. Then I've got to have also in a table object everything that comes from the insert command, which is all of this white stuff. The blue stuff is stuff we call metadata. It's data about data. The actual data from the insert command is what we're going to talk about. When we say the data in a table, we're talking about the black and white stuff. If we talk about metadata, we're talking about the blue stuff, like the, the vendor, the model, etc. Okay, so if we put those in a table object, it also allows us room for future expansion. When we write other commands and we discover, hey, my table object needs the column names, the column types, all the data from the insert, and some other stuff, we just add the other stuff. And we still have at the high level a hash table that goes from a table name string to a table object. And the table object just has more stuff in it now. Okay. So then, you're going to start saying, oh, but you said earlier in the semester that hash tables were big memory hogs and we should be careful with them. Well, true, but first of all, this project is about hash tables. You want to use them. Second of all, the biggest memory in this project comes from the black and white stuff. The stuff that comes from the insert command is going to be much bigger than the blue stuff, the metadata. So it doesn't really matter that at a high level we have an ordered map to match a, ha a table name with the table data and everything else about the table. It doesn't matter whether our 
column names are in a vector or a hash or whatever, it's not that big a deal because they're going to be small compared to the data from the insert command. The data from the insert command is where you need to worry about space. You don't want to let that thing grow by doubling. For example, if I had a table and I was going to insert 1,025 rows and 17 columns, if I let it grow naturally, it'll double up to 1024, it'll then double to 2048 rows, and each row will double from 1 to 2 to 4 to 8 to 16. Then when I add the 17th thing, it'll go to 32. So instead of 1025 by 17, I end up at 2048 times 32, and I'm using almost four times as much memory as I could be using. So the insert command is where you've got to be careful with like resize and reserve. The other stuff, don't worry about it too much. It would be good if you keep the size of the other things reasonable, like what you put in them. We'll talk about that a little bit with index. Index is the other place we can save some memory. We don't want to waste too much memory when we generate an index. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So when we start doing the uh, insert command, and we're talking about, hey, I've got to maintain all of this data in this table. You might be tempted to say, ooh, I'm going to have a hash table here. I'm going to hash from a column name to all the data in that column. And that's a terrible idea. That's a terrible idea because later on, down the line, when it's time to delete a row, you don't delete a row row from one of them, well, from one place, you delete it from number of columns places. And that it's really painful to do and, and hard on the code, hard to implement, hard to do efficiently. So the table here, the, the black and white part, really should be like project one. It should be, well, I don't want to say that project one because we have different project ones. The stuff in the black and white, the, the actual data from the insert command, should be a 2D vector a vector which represents the whole thing with rows and columns. Rows will be the outer dimension. So if I said like my data, square brackets, the first square bracket would be the row number, second square bracket would be the column number, so it'd be a 2D vector. What do we put in it? Table entry. That's where the table entry class comes in that we're going to provide to you as your starter file. You don't have to change it, you're just going to use it. What is a table entry? It's not a template. It's called a variant type. It is a type that can contain other types, but it takes care of things for you. Like a table entry that contains a string always contains a string. It prints like a string. It compares like a string. You can compare it to other strings. You can compare it to other table entries containing strings. You cannot compare a string to an integer. You can't contain a table entry containing a string to a table entry containing an integer. But if you do things right, you'll never have to worry about that. If you do things right, you'll never compare types that are different from each other. You'll only compare the same types. So we want to put that data from the insert command and make 2D vector. So when someone does an insert command, we want to parse out that insert command. They say insert into table name. Well, does that table exist? Because if it doesn't, that's an error. I'm done. I clear out the rest of the insert command and stop. Go back through the loop, read a new command. But if the table name is valid, it does already exist, then the rest of the stuff will be valid. And we read the rest of the line, and then we start running, oh, I don't want to run a loop yet. I want to get the right number of rows. You can't just say resize to the new number. What if this is the second insert command? What if I already have 100 rows, and now I want to add 20 more? I would want to resize to 100 plus 20. Then I would want to put the data in rows 100 through 119. I don't want to read and overwrite the data at index 0 and start where I left off. So then I'm going to resize it, then I'm going to loop for it. The number of rows I'm adding, I'm going to put data into the right row. I've got to loop over the columns. So I've got to have a doubly missed loop for every row that I'm going to add, for every column within that row, 
read something from the CM, like a string or a double or an int or a bool, and then we take and we add a table entry containing that type to the end of the vector. Learn the difference between two things, pushback and emplaceback. Pushback says, I've got an X, I want you to add this X type to the end of the vector. In place back says, I've got Y, but X that I want you to, I really want you to add something of class X, but if I give in place back a Y, Y gets given to the constructor for type X. What we mean here is, if I've got a row, the idea of a row is a vector of table entries. If I say, hey, whatever row I'm on, in place back this string, the string gets handed to the constructor, and the constructor runs right where that string should go within this row. So I would in place back a string, in place back a string, in place back an integer, in place back a double, because I'd be going through a loop. I'd say, loop through all the columns. If this column type is a string, I read a string, I in place back a string. If this type of this column is a double, I read a double, I in place back a double. And I do that in a loop for every column. So that's basically our insert command. For every row, for every column, read the right type, in place back that type. Okay, where are we? Print all. Okay, so now that we've got an insert done, we can do a print all command. So we, we print all, we're basically gonna have a big loop of let's loop through every row, let's loop through all the columns that the user requested that we print, because we might not wanna print all of them. Someone might have said, print the, just the model names and the mileage. So we would loop through every row, we'd loop through two columns, just the two that they want printed, and we'd print the Corvette, the mileage on the Corvette, we'd print the next Corvette, the mileage on the other Corvette, etc. So we'd print 11 lines of output for print all. Now, after you get all of those done, then it's time to start doing delete and print where. The thing you want to be careful of in delete and print where, don't try to make these one function. Start breaking things down. And really, I've gotten, I've gone too far without saying this, breaking things down. If you have a table class, you can have the table class can have member functions like, hey, I'm a table member function that inserts rows. I'm a table member function that does printing. I'm a table member function that handles print all. I also have a table member function that does a print where. So it gets really good in here if we break it down into functions, member functions of the table class, and helper functions to help people do their job. So I could have a print function, I could have a print all function, I could have a print where function, and then print where is going to get broken up further down the line. When you start breaking up the things like, especially delete and print, what we don't want to see, we don't want to see a 12-way split because delete and print where, I might say delete um, or print where the column is, say, uh, the price is greater than 10,000, or print where the model is less than fusion. So the comparison, there might be a, a difference on what comparison type is done, and what is the variable type that we're looking at. So we don't want to do a 12-way split. I don't want to see code like, if it's a string and it's less than, else if it's a string and it's greater than, else it's, ooh. Break it down into four-way split of the type, read the type, and call a helper with a table entry containing that type. So I start by saying, hey, let's, let's start processing that print command. I know the table name exists. Oh, it's a where command. So I call print where, print where figures out what is the column name, what's the type of that column, does the column exist? If it does exist, what's its type? Let's read a variable of that type and call a helper with a table entry. So if I said print where model is less than fusion, I would read the string, fusion, and I would call a helper with a table entry containing that string. 
And then that helper can then, it's not templated. It just says, I received a table entry. I know which column I'm talking about. It's got to be the right type. Then that function can do a three-way split on the comparison type. Is it less than? Is it greater than? Is it equal to? Don't write the code three times. This is a great place to do things like maybe make another helper. This gets a little more complicated because eventually you're going to want to use a functor for the comparison. Why would I want to use a functor? Because of delete. When we delete, let's talk about delete. When we delete, let's say I did a um, delete where model is less than um, Tesla. Really, that's a vendor, but we'll pretend. Uh, print, print where model is, or I could say, you know, there's a, I keep thinking of vendors. Anyway, I say print where model is less than Tesla, or, or delete, delete where model is less than Tesla. The wrong way to do it is say, ooh, row zero, that's less than Tesla. Let's erase row zero and move everybody else a lot more. Oh, wait, because I deleted row zero, I've got to stay on row zero. This is less than Tesla, so let's delete this row and move everybody else one. Oh, wait, I've got to stay on zero, that's less than Tesla. Delete it, move everybody else up one. That's the wrong way to do it. That's n squared. We don't like n squared. A better way to do it is to use the STL. Look at the STL algorithms, and in fact, you should be looking in Canvas, Files, Resources, algolist.pdf, it's in there. Look for something that will help you get rid of things within a container given a some sort of condition of how you would like to, when you would like to remove this thing or not remove it. So if we look at that, we'll find the STL algorithm that will help us do it, and it's going to be O of N. What it's going to do is it's going to say, if, let's say I did delete where model is less than fusion. It would say, ooh, a Corvette. I don't like that. Let's remember, I don't like this first Corvette. Next Corvette, I don't like you, don't like you, don't like you. Aha, I see a Malibu. I like a Malibu. Let's overwrite the first Corvette with the first Malibu. Move them both forward. Ooh, I like this Malibu also. Let's overwrite this second Corvette with the second Malibu. It'll rearrange it and put the things it likes at the beginning and it will leave the things it doesn't like untouched. And then you've got to say, hey, I now have to make my 2D vector have less rows because it doesn't actually delete rows. It just rearranges the contents. But you want to use the STL to do the deleting. And the STL thing that you're going to use is going to need a functor that can say, the, the STL algorithm is going to say, hey, I'm looking at this thing and functor. Do we like this, yes or no? Do we want to get rid of it, yes or no? So the functor has to be able to accept something like a, what? A row. It's got to be able to accept a row and know whether or not it likes it. For the functor to be able to do that, it's got to know, hey, when I receive a row, I've got to look in this column and look for this value. I need to look in column one for fusion meaning the functor would have to have member variables, which column to look in, and what value to compare to. Wait a minute, wouldn't that value be one of four different types? No, it would be a table entry containing the right type. So when we do our breakdown, we want to have like a four-way split on the type to read, call the helper with the, with the uh, table entry containing what we read, then do a three-way split on uh, what's the comparison. I could make a functor, call another helper function with the functor, and let that helper do the work. Now that helper, wait, that function is going to receive a functor. I don't know the type of that functor, because it could be one of three different types. Got to be templated. So look at like when we did um, set union. When we did set union, we wrote the code for that. We said, hey, we're going to be templated on this uh, helper function that we're, going to, that we're going to have. So take a look at that. It'll help you on getting that syntax right. When you need to make the functor itself, it's going to have to initialize its member variables. Look at how we did the index sort is 
similar to the way you want to do it, not completely, but you're going to have to have a table entry that's initialized. You're going to find table entry objects cannot be default constructed. You can't have a table entry that contains no known type. All table entries must be created with a particular type, and so your functor is going to have to have a constructor that initializes the member variable. Let's see what else I think. Oh, yes. Make three functors. One for less than, one for greater than, one for equal to. Do not make one functor that does all three jobs and has another member variable that indicates its comparison type because then your functor is slower than our functor. We want to have a functor that does a job, not a functor that does three jobs and has to figure out which job it's doing right now. Would slow things down a bunch. Okay, let's see. So we've talked about deleting, we've talked about printing. Printing, print all, really simple. Print where is probably the hardest part of this. When I wrote a new solution to this, to do like a really straightforward solution, I knew what I wanted to have happen, and I had two false starts on the code for print where. And then I did what I tell you to do. I drew it out. So I took just two, three minutes to draw it out, and then I coded the whole thing through. But it's really hard to get print where working without having a good idea of that breakdown of the, let's read the type with a four-way split, let's call a helper, let's do a three-way split on the functor, call another one. And then when you get all that done, then you're going to generate an index. And then you're going to have to go back and say, how does generate index affect all these other commands? What's the most efficient way to handle it and make use of it? What is the idea of an index? The idea of an index is, suppose I knew I'm using your program, and I know with, with this data, I'm going to be doing lots of comparisons based on price. Then it would be in my best interest to tell your program, hey, I want you to generate me an index on the price column to make my future commands faster. Like if I'm going to be doing lots of prints, where price is greater than or price is less than, I would want to have a BST index on price. BST index can help with less than and greater than, and can help with equal to. If I was doing a comparison on model, I'm probably, given this data, I'm probably going to be doing equality comparisons on model. I could create either a BST or a hash. They both help with equals. Only a BST index helps with less than or greater than. So when you get the index generated, you want to go back to all the other commands and say, what does this command have to do different now that I have indices? And in some places, it'll just be adding some code. Some places, it'll be doing things like, oh, if you've got an index and it's on the right column and it's helpful, do it the new way, else old code. And so then that will, uh, that will add to your code, but it won't make you throw away code, except for maybe how you do join. Join, if you do it inefficiently, you might have to rewrite it to make indices more cool and helpful there. But that's getting towards the end of the project. So I don't want to do another video later on, so let's talk about join. So let me pull up. An example here. Oops, I don't have an easy way to page. Oh, wait, let's see. So I join. Okay, come on. Hey, it's not. It's flashing at me, but it's not going there. Okay, here we go. Here's the start of join. Okay, so the idea of join is to join two tables together. And we've got an example in here of here's my input. I created pets and I inserted stuff into it, and I joined pets and 281 class. And 281 class is another table from another example. It says join the pets table with the 281 class table, where name, name is the column in pets, equals person, person is the column in 281 class, where those are equal, where the name in pets and the person in 281 class are the same, and print three columns. What am I going to print? I'm going to print name from the one means table one, pets. 
So print name from table one, emotion from table two, and likes dogs from table one. And here's the example output. So it would print here, the first line is the column headers. This is basically the names of the columns from the uh, join command. And then each of these is a row combination. Whenever the name in one matches the person in the other, a row gets produced. So Sith matched two things, Paleni matched one thing. If we did, let's go back to the very beginning. Okay. Let's say I had a table of cars that professors own. Now, if that table had something like a vendor, I've got five professors who all own Chevrolets, and we join the vendor owned with the vendor from the marketplace. It would end up printing five times 11 because every row in the first table matches every row in the second table. We've got to print n times m rows. What if the professor cars, what if all professors own Teslas? Then there would be no matches. Every row in the first table would match no rows in the second table. Nothing would get printed. So the output from join could be anywhere from zero rows up to n times m. Depends on how many rows in this table match up with rows in that table. So if, for example, if I had a table I'll give you an example from real life. I've got a table that has models that professors own. My professors owning cars table has two entries. Paoletti Malibu, that's what I own, and Darden Tesla, that's what he owns. If we joined the model owned in 281 Prop Cars with the car marketplace model, what would happen is Malibu, Pale Eddie Malibu, would match with the last six, and we'd print six things. And then Tesla from the Prof Cars table would match nobody, and we would print nothing. So this is a place where uh, the straightforward approach is loop through every row in the first table, loop through every row in the second table. If the column data match, you print something, otherwise you don't. And that's going to turn out to be n times m is going to be a bit slow. It could always be that bad, but what if it's not that bad? What if Tesla in the first table matches no one in the second table? I would like to be able to do that faster than looping through all of them. And this is where indices can help. OK, I think I've covered everything I wanted to cover for Project 3 Silly QL. We'll be having off hours and Piazza and everything else to help you out. So read the spec, watch the video, go back and forth, make notes, make notes about your design, and how you're laying things out, and enjoy the project. This is, I think, a really good project to teach you a lot of useful stuff about hash tables, which any of our staff can tell you hash tables are going to come up in coding interviews. So good luck, everyone.